Dr. Carey, welcome to Dad Edge. Good to have you. Thank you, Larry. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's good to it's good to be here. So, uh, first of all, before we get started on, on your book and and some of the, the beautiful things that have come out of this, and we're gonna be talking about intention, we're gonna be talking about resilience, we're gonna be talking about confidence, and and not being the victim and all that, and how we can lead our kids into into that type of mindset. But I would really just love to hear from you. How did you even get into the work that you're doing today? Well, as a therapist um, yeah. and a writer. Um, I guess I always knew I wanted to be a therapist since high school and college, you know, the typical, oh, you're a good listener. Um, but I think as you'll hear in the novel, I I lost my mother in childhood. So I, I know well that experience. So I think I was always drawn towards how to help people who've gone through something similar. Um, so I went right from college to graduate school. And then the writing came later, maybe 10 years ago, where I started to write in different forms, whether essays or op-eds, and then most recently, the novel. Um, and then, so how old were you when you lost your mom? I was nine and a half. Wow. Can, can you just, just for context, take us back to being nine and a half, lo losing your mother? I mean, that the story I'm telling myself is, I mean, any age to lose a parent is traumatic, but especially a child you know, losing a parent, you know, earlier than what we ever think. And, you know, what, what was going on for you at that age when this happened? Yeah. Well, and again, that's some of what I try to capture in the novel, but, um, you know, I think at nine, you're so busy trying to just be living and being a kid. I think the defenses are so high, you know, so it's not like you imagine a, uh, an adult grieving or weeping. I think my, my siblings and I, I'm not even sure I cried at times because it didn't seem real. I, I think most children, even though intellectually I would have said, oh, I know my mother died. I think deep down is the fantasy. It didn't really happen. And we even see this in adults, even though adults, you think that sounds crazy. I think the fantasy is how can we imagine someone who is essential to who we are being gone? I mean, you think of a phantom limb, you know, like how do you imagine a child needs a parent as part of themselves still? Um, and so a child can barely comprehend that this parent is, is gone. Um, so it took a while to absorb it. I mean, I think it, it changed forms as I got older. Um, in by adulthood where I could fully grieve like an adult, actually. Um, so, but for a kid, it was trying to quickly go back to school and more embarrassment. Oh, the kids will know something happened. You know, all the typical way a kid's mind goes, you know? So, um, you know, being embarrassed, I was missing something everyone else had. Um, um, and then I was fortunate though, to have siblings that we all pulled together and um, we're a tight unit, which I think helped us get through it. Um, but I think kids just follow the lead of the parent. And like the father in this novel, um, my father gave the, us the feeling we had to just find our way through and he was gonna be there for us. And he was both mother and father then. So I don't know if that answers it all, but I think it doesn't look like an adult grieving. Yeah. I think the pain, the pain of it doesn't, become real till later. Yeah. You know, it's, it, I, I have a nine-year-old right now and mm. I think about, you know, like my gosh, like how would, how would I lead him through that? Like how would he, or even taking it back to when I, when I was nine or when we're all nine years old and we, and we go through something that could be traumatic. Right. And uh, it's just really trying to understand that. Um, as far as the father, in the novel. Was that inspired by your own father? Yes, very much yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to capture the book was almost, it was originally called the good father because so many novels today, you know, everyone is the bad, you know, all the bad things that happen. And I really wanted to capture a good father, even though he has foibles, makes mistakes. He, he is genuinely a, a good, a good father and helped particularly with uh, four daughters um, that he made them feel that they were, just as important as sons and they could do anything they wanted in life. And the book takes place in 1970 and um, that was less likely then. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And, and a lot of these skills that you talk about, a lot of the way that this father shows up in this novel, right. It just, it's so 
important of how dads can show up now. And the, one of the things you talk about is, is intention. And I'll tell you from my experience and I'm sure yours, right. And, and doing therapy for as long as you have and counseling for as long as you have is I've noticed in our world, I hear that word a lot. I want to be more intentional, but right. when we, when I really press men for that one, or I try to really get an understanding of what that means for them in their world. Sometimes it's more like this cerebral idea. It's almost like going to the doctor and the doctor looks at your blood work and he's like, all right, Larry, here's the deal, man. I need you to get healthy. Right. And you're like, uh, right. okay. Yeah. Well, right. What does that even mean? Do I have high cholesterol? Do I have diabetes? Like is something, you know, was my PSA high? Like what's going on here? Yeah. Right. So we right. really don't know necessarily what intention is all about, but you know, there's a very creative way that you talk about in this novel of how this father got intentional. But before we even get to that, I would just love to hear your opinion on that word intentional. Um, yeah, how it's used today. I think you're right. It's used in, in such a hocus pocus sort of general way, right? What would that mean? But I think this father, it's very practical. You have to first imagine something or picture it happening and then put your energy towards making it happen but no one is going to do it for you you have to so it's not like you have intention and it just suddenly something appears but then you have to work at it so the father in the novel has this idea of he has business cards that he's collected and when the children want or imagine they want to like in the, the book the uh, one of the daughters wants to be the lead in the play he said, well, first you have to have intention. And he has her write it on the card and he carries it in his wallet until it happens. And she does get it. So again, he's not meaning that everything always will happen, but you have to first believe in yourself and believe you can see yourself. And the father in the book also talks about, you know, close your eyes and imagine yourself on stage. And you have to be able to picture yourself accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Um so today when it's used, yeah, I'm trying to think other ways it's used today in terms of intentionality. Um, it's just such a general term, as you're saying, like going to the doctors, what does that actually mean practically? Um, but this father would say, you have to be specific. You have to have some goal you're wanting and you have to put your intention towards it. And for the father in the book, they write, it was like his religion almost. The mother is Catholic, but the father's religion is intentionality. You have to believe in yourself. I'm really curious when it comes to, you know, teaching our kids to believe in themselves. It's, I, I noticed that we say it a lot as adults, like, hey, just, right. be, just believe in yourself, right? But it's almost like, hey, just be intentional or, hey, just get healthier. What do you, th in your experience, what has been some of the most effective ways that we can teach kids how to believe in themselves? Well, I think the first thing is separating ourselves out from what we wish they would be. You know, when they do what we want, oh, I'm so proud of you, but it's really not who the kid is. So I think the first is trying to really see your child for who they are and really what their wishes and ambitions are. And in a, some way, almost as parents to stay more neutral to it, you know, like allow them to be who they are, and, like take pleasure in it and, it and point out when they've done something that they, that they feel proud of, but not that they're doing it to make us feel good. And I think a lot of kids are very aware of what our parents want us to want. And I think we, our goal should be really to appreciate who that child is, even if it's very different than we are. Um, gives real confidence. Telling a kid and winning awards always does not build confidence. I think confidence comes out of working hard at something they believe in and seeing they can do it um, separate than the parents. So that's true confidence. So really and giving not... a kid a voice, giving a right. kid a voice. Yeah. So when you say giving a kid a voice, like what does that look like? That you really do want to hear sort of like you were saying earlier, helping a kid put into words what they are feeling. Say a parent does die, you'd be sitting there asking what the experience is for them and being open to hearing it. So often as parents, we subtly give the impression, well, you don't really feel that, you feel this. And you know, pushing them to go in a way that they have to deny their feelings. 
And confidence comes from really knowing what you're feeling and then being able to manage it without the parent managing it for you. I think nowadays, parents are so worried that their kids feel anything upsetting. They step in automatically and try to prevent it. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes nowadays is that then when they hit adolescence and they hit a real problem, the child is lost. I mean, they really fall apart versus letting kids at a younger age manage a problem on their own. You know, nowadays, I know when I was a kid, if the school said we did something wrong, my parents would say, okay, what did you do? You better fix it. And nowadays parents step in and say, you know, don't say that about my child. They didn't do anything wrong. There's a protecting children, I think, too far. (laughs) Um, And I see that in my therapy practice. You know, I've had parents call, you know, uh, a child will break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend in high school and they'll say, oh, my child is traumatized. They need therapy. And I'm like, no, no, a breakup is not traumatizing. <laughs> you know, let them, let them. And you have to sort of like the father in the novel, believe they can get through it. Believe they have the capability because nothing gives a kid more confidence in that a parent believes they can manage it. They know what they're doing. And I think we want to impart that to kids. And I think we take away their um, capacities in some ways too early. Do you think, so... You have we've done a lot of studies, or well, a, a lot of interviews on on validation, right? And not fixing their problems, but just validating what it is that they're feeling, right? So, like, take this breakup for instance, right? Or maybe they did something wrong at school. Be like, wow, you know, I can really, I can really understand how you probably feel a little lost right now, or maybe you feel overwhelmed right now. And instead of like literally pulling the ripcord on this golden parachute to make everything better you know, what we do is maybe have invite them into a conversation of what, you know, solving the problem could look like, but would it be more asking questions than it would be telling? Right. They're not telling. And yeah, what could they do? I mean, I always tell parents when a kid is having trouble, ask them what they think they could do, put them in the mind that they can solve it. And even saying to them, you know, I, I know you can come up with something. What do you think you can do to repair this? And and expect them, you know, say they got in trouble ex- at school, to expect them to do something to make amends or repair. Um, but I think asking the questions rather than telling. And again, every kid is different. There's some kids who are so um, careful themselves, a parent hardly has to set any rules. And those are the kids, I have had kids, my own kids, where one of them, I'm like, take a day off from school because she was so always being, you know, the perfect child. Whereas another one of our kids would be like, we'd have to come down much harder. So it depends on the child. You know, some kids need loosening up a little bit and others need reining in. Um, But I think asking questions and not having, I think we don't even, you know, so many parents will say, well, I don't care what they do. It's fine. But they're giving messages all the time that they have a great deal of, um, uh, opinion about what the kids should be doing or not doing, whether it's academic or sports or, you know, living. Our kids are sort of extensions of us, but I think we've gone too far about them um, living for us in a sense, rather than their own lives. Um, I, I feel like we see this in Little League all the time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, the dad, mom yelling and screaming. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's almost yeah. like, too, that. They're the parents and I I used to, so I have four boys. I have two teenagers and two little ones. And I made that mistake when my little guy, my, 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 my teenagers were in little league. I mean, I wasn't over the top, but I was just like, I didn't want them to fail out there, you know? And that, but, um, now I just, I, I don't, I don't say a word when, when they're out there playing sports. I mean, I'll clap, you know, Yeah, But, but I don't, yeah, I, I pretty much keep quiet. And when I keep quiet, I I hear everything else around me. Right. And I, I have it is. And I'm probably I, I mean, I, th- I I you know, I'm I'm in my I'm in, I'm 47 now. So like I have a nine year old and a seven year old. So compared to some of the of the other parents that I'm in the stands with, I'm a bit on the older side probably. Right. So like a lot of these parents are in their, like their thirties and I was doing the same things that they were doing, which is like, it's almost like they have an overwhelming fear of their kids messing up 
or, you know, or, or they're coaching from the stands or it's just like, and it, it comes from like this intensity, right. That we want our kids to do well so bad that, and I, I don't know exactly where it comes from. I'm sure everybody's motivation is a bit different. It's either like, Hey, I don't want to see my kid fail. I don't want them to have the feeling of failure or I want, I want so badly for them to get excited and to feel this joy that maybe I had playing sports growing up or whatever that might be. But, um, I'm sure it could probably, you know, really impact a kid's psyche. And you know, before we move on to the next couple items, I, I am curious though, from a therapist point of view, from, you know, a psychological impact, if we're putting a ton of pressure, like if we're not the coach, we're just the parent right? We're in the stands, right? Yeah. But what is the psychological impact of a kid out there? And let's face it, for the most part, they should be just be, ha they should be having fun out there. That's what the hope is. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what the hope right. is. Um, but what is the psychological impact for, for kids who feel a ton of pressure? Yeah, it takes the natural drive and pleasure out of it. Because I see these kids in therapy and they tell me about the mom or dad who's yelling at them and why aren't you, you know, pushing them and pushing them, whether sports or academics. And by the time they graduate high school, they've just been pushed and pushed that many of them have lost the drive or the pleasure in doing it before college even. it's I hear these seniors in high school going, I'm burnt out. What's the point? Um, and that's pretty sad. Um because I think these parents have viewed their kids as a reflection of themselves rather than their own person. Um, and you mentioned this idea of the fear of them failing, whereas I would argue we it's such an opportunity when a kid fails that we should see it as an opportunity for growth and that kids have to be able to fail in order to figure out how to work harder the next time or maybe that wasn't what interested them. But I think we have really gotten to this fear of our kid failing at all. And and I think some of it comes out of parents today feeling such pressure for achievement, you know, good colleges, getting ahead, getting ahead, um, that they think, oh, I have to give my kid every opportunity. You know, it used to be kids could play three sports in high school and enjoy it. Now kids at seven are going, you know, <laughs> serious one sport. They have to do travel teams. They have to work at it. And I think it's crushing to these kids. It It really removes the fun of playing, which you can learn a lot from playing, but without all the, the driven, even academics, not all the driven, can't they just enjoy learning? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always love the story of um, the Wright brothers um, and the ingenuity and all that they could do with the flight. And when, I don't know if it was which Orville or his brother went off to start school at kindergarten. And about a month in, the teacher showed up at the house and said to the father that he hasn't been coming to school all month. So the father called him down and said, where have you been going? He said on his first day, he went past a barn and he found an old sewing machine and he's been taking it apart and putting it back together. Father said, take me there. And he showed him, he said, keep going. <laughs> you know, to the sewing machine. Right. And what a father to just, you know, um, allow to see that the kid had such ingenuity was making use of it. And look what he went on to do. So I think kids will go on to do more when a parent lets them discover it for themselves. Such a good point. And I, I look back on my own life and, and the life of, you know, friends and family and some of the most brown groundbreaking lessons came from failure came yes. from doing it wrong and learning mm -hmm. and pivoting right and if I, mm -hmm. I we protect our kids so much from that yeah. the other thing too like i i've, I've had a i think 30 32 navy seals i think have been on this podcast okay. and a few of them have come on and said you can always tell uh in buds which is the six month training up uh, you know to to even be a seal is the the people that never failed the ones that everything came easy to them right and it's always like these star athletes and it's school came easy and athletics came easy and then they go to buds and they just get their rear end handed to them over and over and over again he's like these are the guys yeah. that go first he's right. like because they're not used to failing one, one of the guys who came yeah. on his name was larry yatch he said he had a he had a, he had a really hard road as a kid, you know, it wasn't the best with athletics, you know, wasn't the best with school. And so <laughs> he really got that resilience muscle worked a lot as a kid. 
Yeah. And when he got the buds, he's like, wait a second. So all I have to do is not quit. That's, that's really it. That's all I have to do. Like in his mind, it was totally different. And he's like, I, I can do that like that. Yeah. And he did, he got through buds just fine. And I yeah. mean, not just, I, but you know, you get the point of like the, the people who have had that resilience muscle just worked over and over again, you know, that they're. Bit- yeah. It's a muscle. It's a good way to say it. There was um, an interesting study of the, some of the most successful adults, whatever that means, you know, people who've accomplished a lot of what they've wanted in life, lost a parent in childhood, um, particularly between the ages of seven and 12 latency. And I thought that was such an interesting study because I think, and again, it depends on what happens around the loss, but a hardship doesn't mean someone's crushed. It it can mean great strengths come out of it. And if I had any encouragement for parents nowadays is, as we're saying, let kids fail, let them struggle and do not solve all their problems. And I mean, I was, I'm a parent of kids and I was tempted the same way. Of course, you don't want your kids to be upset, but I would have to remind myself to let them let them figure out what what to do. And I think, as you said, it's easier as we get older. There's something about maturity. I think we feel more separate a bit, maybe as we get older. When we're younger, we're so identified with our kids. Um, and Great. I think a little separateness helps. Like, okay, they're doing their thing. Yeah. Exactly. I, I love that. Uh, you know, and speaking of which, you know, one of the other points you make in the book is it, it is these lumps. Right. And it's, it's, it's being resilient and you've got actually one story in particular about toilet paper in in the book about, about this father who, um, who literally uses humor and he has to get creative and he, you know, he takes, takes what could be a a quote unquote challenging situation and he turns it into something, but I would love for you to share that. Yeah. There's a bunch of those in the book. One of them was, um, that uh, it's a Sunday and the stores are done and they realize the family, five children, they're out of toilet paper and they're all complaining, figuring out what to do. And so he says, okay, kids, get in the car. We're going to Friendly's for ice cream after dinner. And they all are excited. And suddenly the dad goes into the bathroom and walks out and he said, okay, head for the car. And they walk out and they see he has two rolls of toilet paper, one under each arm and says, you know, makes a joke of it. Okay. We're breaking away, you know, and it's breaking a rule, but the kids could laugh, but he figured out a way to get uh, toilet paper. And there's another scene in the book where um, uh, he had to figure out one of his children right after the mother died, her birthday was late and he really needed her to be in school. So he put her in the Catholic school And one day he's sending the kids off to school. And one of the older daughters says, you know, um, Annie doesn't have school because it's some religious holiday. And the father doesn't, you know, he's got to go to work. What do I do? And he brings the kids out and the younger, the the son is the youngest. He he pushes him up onto the bus and he sends Annie right along to nursery school with him. (laughs) And the older daughters are like, you can't send her to another school. And he goes, that's what school's for. She'll be fine. And she spent the day there. So, I mean, he's resourceful, you know, he's not afraid to break a few rules, but uh, right. he comes up with a way to make it manage. And he's, he does it with a smile, telling the kids, it'll be okay. Um, but I think some of that attitude too, he wasn't, um, the father is not an angry man. So he responds with warmth. You know, another scene is with the main character, Jody, when she turns 13 and such a vulnerable age and decides she wants to get a bra. Um, the father right away says, well, then you need one, even though ostensibly she really didn't, but he brings her into the, he makes her feel proud. He brings her into the store and tells the saleswoman to help her. And the saleswoman looks down at the daughter and says, well, I don't think so. She's not ready. And the father said very firmly, no, my daughter is ready. She said she needs a bra and she needs one. So that kind of modeling of treating the child with respect, you know, he didn't humiliate her. He didn't say, oh, you don't need one. He treated it with great seriousness. And that's a very good father to be able to, to do that for a daughter. Um, hey, you think that about brings that. confidence. You know? Right. Yeah. I, that's what I was actually just going to say. It, it, it feels like just a very confident moment, you know, believing in the child, you know, and, and that, that social proof, right. That it's in front of even somebody else. The, right. the cool thing too, is it, you mentioned in there, uh, taking things very, very seriously. And then that there's this theme, even with the toilet paper of a sense of humor that was present. And I've noticed, and I don't know if it's just, I, I'm sure it's not just our generation of dads. I'm sure it's been every generation of dads, but we tend to 
take things very seriously, right? <laughs> I, and I would, I would even venture to say too seriously. And mm -hmm. I was actually just at a conference a couple of weeks ago that I spoke at. And one of the speakers was talking about these, these five, what he calls the five dials of your wife still being attracted to you. And one of the dials was humor. And yeah. we were all like, oh, and he, he called it being playful. And it was yeah. basically right in that theme of like, listen, when things go wrong and you flip out, like there's nothing more unattractive, like to your wife, right. than you flipping out, acting like one of her children. Like, he's like, what would right. it look like if you were, he's like, I'm not saying like, you know, if, if somebody was in a car accident, you use humor. He's like, but like, like your example, right? Like, yeah. wait, what? We're out of toilet paper. Are you kidding me? Why didn't you right. do it? Right. Instead of doing something right. like that. Anger. Like, right. Anger. You use, you use humor, but. Um, tell us about, you know, the psychological, the psychological impact of being maybe even more playful or more humorous in our relationships. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I think one of the leading aspects of resilience is a sense of humor. I just thought of a, a story my sister told me. She also has a wonderful husband and uh, he woke her up in the morning. She had left the water running in the laundry room, I guess, all night. And so my, her husband, Bill, went down to the basement and the basement was completely flooded, but he came upstairs and woke her up and said, honey, should I shut it off now? Were you going for five inches or seven inches down there? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, what a great uh, guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. He took it, you know, and she, she then went, oh no, but I thought that's the best of husband. You know, he, he, he could yeah. laugh. I mean, it wasn't great. He helped clean it up, but why be angry and why make someone, you know, I think the father in this book too, he never teases and he never shames. And I think for children, truly some of the most crushing aspects is when a parent teases or shames a child. Um, I think that's what we always want to be aware of. And yeah, this husband could have clearly been angry or said, you know, but my brother-in-law made it funny. You know, were you going for five or seven inches? <laughs> you know, and then they went and dealt with it. It doesn't mean you don't deal with it. But, um, so, um, but anyway, he used humor. And I think using humor is the best in any marriage, any relationship, even teaching children to be able to laugh at themselves. Right. Um, is it really, and again, that doesn't mean teasing though. When a parent teases, there's a cruelty to it sometimes, and that's different, but real sense of humor is not cruel. So g give us an example of teasing and give us an example of shaming. Well, yeah, like in this book, if the father said, oh, isn't that sweet? You need a bra? No, you don't, you know, <laughs> or made her feel ashamed for wanting it. It could have, a lot of fathers might have done, you know, because the character in the book is still yeah. undeveloped, but he could have teased or, you know, um, said something mean. Uh, or it, And sometimes it comes out of anxious. Say the father felt anxious at the daughter needing a bra, you know, what with sexuality or something, and instead he belittled her. That child would get an experience of, of shame of her body and not being enough. Instead, this father made her feel she had, you know, she had whatever it was she was hoping for. Um, I guess the, the psychological safety of that kid coming back and, and being authentic and vulnerable with you, if there is teasing and shaming that might seem like harmless to us, but the impact might be very real to them. The chances of them coming back and opening up to us is that probably decreases over time. Correct. Oh, yeah, they'd be afraid to talk about it. And then you would hope at least if one parent does that, you have the other parent to validate it. If the child says that hurt my feelings to say, you're right, that that did hurt. I mean, you're, you're acknowledging it, it was hurtful, you know, and, and then you'll hear a parent say, oh, I'm just teasing. No, you're not just teasing, you know, right. you're, you're, you're being hurtful. And yeah. pet, parents who were teased as a child, you tend to do what was done to you. And that can be a uh, a common way of reacting to kids, belittling their feelings or, you know, imitating them if they're crying or don't be a cry baby or um, again, making a child feel ashamed for what they're feeling. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. You and I are having this conversation. I, I put on, uh, we put a video on our Instagram reel of, uh, so I have a 15 year old and, you know, it's interesting, like as much as we don't want to like label our kids, like we, we do that as parents, I think, you know, it's just sure. sometimes by default. So my 15 year old, he's like physically, like he's, 
you know, he's burly, he's very muscular, like football, wrestling, he's track, you know, and he's, he's very stoic. He's kind of quiet, but he's also kind of a softy a little bit, but he's, he's kind of a, you know, he's definitely at that age now where he's like, likes to lift weights and he's kind of the, I wouldn't say the tough guy, but like, he kind of gives off that persona of like, I'm, I'm an athlete. Right. And so I always like, I had, I, I had this sort of image of him now. I'm like, well, he's probably too cool now for me to like hug on him and like that kind of thing. And, and, uh, literally I asked him, I was like, Hey, what, what are, what are one or two or three things that you wish I did more of, you know, to, to show you that I, that I love you. Right. And his response shocked me. He goes, you want to know? I was like, yeah, I would love to know. He goes, hug me, hug me, hug me. I was like, are you serious? That is so wonderful. I know. I was like, I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. I was like, Oh man. I was like, I just was kind of under the impression that like, you know, you're kind of like this older dude. Now you're in the weight room. Like, it's not cool if dad hugs you. He's like, no, he's like, actually it's the opposite. I was like, so I, I was like, well, dude, come here, man, bring it in. So I posted this on our Instagram and this, this, and, and my, like I said, my son is like my 15 year old. He's like this, he is like a built dude and he's very tough. Mm -hmm. And the, in the video, there's not a picture of him or anything like that. And this guy comments on the, on my post saying like, you're raising a, I'll just leave it at that. And I'm like, are you uh, kidding me, man? Like, come on. Like, I would hate to be your kid. That is right? so wrong. Yeah. You're raising a secure <laughs> boy who could yeah. love someone then. And I, boy, I love your son that he could say he wanted that. I mean, that says yeah. everything. And, and that you are a dad who asked him. I mean, that's an extraordinary moment. I mean, it sounds simple, but it's, that's truly extraordinary. And I think kids do want to be hugged, um, which I mentioned too, like with this dad bringing his daughter for a bra, particularly some dads pull away from their daughters with hugs because, you know, this uncomfortableness. And I hear teenage girls, there's nothing sadder that their dad pulls away from them. They want their dad to hug them. Again, appropriately, nothing, you know, nothing implied. Um, But I think, yeah, to hold in mind that our kids, even if they're seeming like rough and tough, like your son really do want to be loved, want to be hugged. Um, yes. So I think that's such a good model to ask them. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question though, for you for, you know, obviously I'm a dad of sons, but, uh, dads with daughters, we see this in our community a lot, but I, I really want you to expand on this a little bit. We've noticed, um, and I've had Dr. Elisa Demore come on the podcast as well. And she wrote that book Untangled, and she talks about this sort of natural progression when daughters and fathers, like as, as the daughter gets a little bit older and into the teenage years, that she'll tend to pull back, right. Quite, quite a bit and kind of like make herself maybe even more independent or she'll she'll detach just a little bit and and she'll make it seem so like, Hey, I don't necessarily dad want your presence or your affection or this or that right now, or dad, you're so annoying or whatever else. And guys will take that so personally and they'll take that so extreme. Um, but what, what is psychologically actually happening for a daughter in those ages and that dynamic with their dads? Yeah, I mean, I think because there is this budding sexuality um, that um, they pull away from dad sometimes. And again, chicken and egg, sometimes does the dad pull away? You know, so it depends on every pair. Um, but more often you hear of daughters pull away from the mom more, you know, yeah. that sometimes they fight more with the mother uh, mm-hmm. as a way to separate. So I think sometimes the closer the relationship is, the more you see of putting up a wall because kids by teenage years are naturally trying to separate a bit and be able to go off. And you want to see a little bit of rebellion. I often warn parents who are saying, oh, my kid is being so difficult as a teenager. I'm like, be thankful. If they look perfect through teenage years, it's maybe you'll see more trouble later because it's natural for a high school kid to buck up a little, to differentiate, you know, and to be able to separate particularly go off for a job or college, you know, they need to say, I don't need you so much. But I think even though they're saying, I don't need you, it's the parent's job to say, well, I'm still here, you know, not pull away out of injury because we feel hurt. I mean, I know I did with my daughter when she was rejecting, it was still like, oh no, she, you know, it it hurt, even though intellectually I knew what she was doing before college. Um, It's hard not to feel it, but I think we want to still, like you did with your son, what else can I do? I'm here. 
and kids know if you're there. I mean, even if they're being, because I see the teenagers who, even though they said, oh, I was so awful to my parent, but later on they say, oh, I felt terrible, really. But they'll never tell the parent they felt bad. Right, right. <laughs> but they they do. They're very attached. I mean. Is it a good message for parents to say, hey, whether you're, and let's just take dads with daughters, dads with sons, it probably doesn't matter. But if the teenager is starting to pull away, well, if they're going to pull away, then I'm going to pull away. Like, and maybe we right. don't say that out loud or even, but that's what might be rumbling underneath of like, well, then I'm just, I think it's probably most important that as a parent, it's like, no, I'm going to do my part in this, whether you reciprocate or not, because exactly. that's my, that is my job. That's my place. And whether or not you hug me back or you think I'm annoying or, you know, you, you welcome it that's on you, but I'm still going to show up. Cause I think it's probably, you probably have had people sit in your office where they remember as a kid, I remember the dad, I remember the day that dad kind of gave up on our relationship. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing more crushing. I had a mother recently say, I'm so hurt by my daughter. I'm just going to ignore her, let her go live with her dad. And I said, that's the worst thing you could do. You're only confirming her worst fear. So you have to be, able, it's sort of like I was saying earlier, be able to feel separate enough to tolerate, they're going to act that way, but I'm steady. Mm -hmm. And I think a parent just staying steady, no matter how you act, I still love you. I'm still here. And I'm not going to, you're not going to push me away because nothing more terrifying for a child to feel they can do that, <laughs> you know, to have that power. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, 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 that, that's something that is, and that's just detrimental you know, to mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah, which is part in the novel, Jody. some of her guilt was like any child, she at times wished her mother was gone. You know, she was angry. I wish she said, I wish you were dead like a week before she died. And then the burden is, uh oh, I was so powerful. I made that happen. Mm. And there's nothing again, scarier for a kid to feel I really create, even though it was fantasy, right. she didn't, but a child believes that even, you know, kids think they magical thinking all the time right we do right. as adults too <laughs> yeah like i thought it i put it in the universe so therefore it happened right right, right. yeah i i want to as i want to talk about this last point because i think it's um it's it's so important especially now which is uh to not play the victim card you know and to not only play the victim card as a parent but how do we teach that to our kids of, of not playing that victim role. And I know in, in your book, you have, you have, you really illustrate this very well. Yeah. I think it's, again, we were talking about earlier about um, letting kids experience the repercussions and not, Oh, poor you, you know, poor you, this happened. Like you're the um, you're at the effect of what happened. You want a kid to feel that they are, again, intentionality, they make what happens in the world. And if something bad happens, not that it was their fault, but that um, they're not um, a victim to it, but they can make something different happen. Um, sort of also along that idea of um, when something bad happens in life, they're not left traumatized by it. You know, something traumatic happened. I, you know, I know this is not... <laughs> PC nowadays, but even this idea that um, every child has to be protected from hearing words or any kind of experience, I don't think is preparing them well for the world because you want to build up, like you said, a muscle for resilience. And I think we've gone so far of everybody being so careful, um, which again goes against, I am saying we should be careful with our children in terms of shaming and teasing, but not in terms of. Um, facts in the world or what happens and that they can talk about how it feels, but not that we need to keep them from it. Um, how do we, so I, I think you're right. I think the, like everything out there is like, do you think social media plays a major role in this one? Yes. <laughs> how so? I, I think social media has been one of the worst things for children. Um, uh, adolescents. So I see a lot of teenagers. I mean, you know, we all had to live through high school hearing other kids went out and did things, but they get to watch blow by blow as their friends do whatever event they're not included in. Um, the bullying and cruelty that goes on. Um, 
And even for adults, the idea of watching everyone else's lives look so perfect as it's imagined, because people only post the amazing moments, that um, I am very regretful of all the social media. If One thing, if any parents can do with new children, I would do anything to keep their kids off of social media as long as possible. But I think you need the community to do that because when your child is the one kid not allowed and every other kid has a phone at eight years old. <laughs> um, but I think social media is very destructive for children. And also in terms of in attention spans, I see in kids, they all talk about they can hardly read five pages because they're immediately used to being um, inundated with new material. Um, so I don't know how we turn the clock back on that, but I, I think it's, you know, not been a positive. Of course, I mean, everything has, you know, there was ways we could connect with people, you know, there's certain positives in it. But I think for kids growing up, you'd want to keep it, keep them away from it. And I think it's worse on girls. Boys, boys like the gaming more, but they don't seem to get as caught up in the minutia of the the social media of who's saying what about who. Girls really seem to be the most affected by that part. And do you think as far as like the victim role goes, I, you know, I, sometimes I, I notice it with, with people our age and sometimes I don't where people will literally lay out everything that is against them. And, and then you see like hundred plus comments of like, I'm so sorry, this is going on. And, and not that, not that people, not that you want to say, Hey, like, you know, people shouldn't go through a hard time. People are going to go through seasons of life where things exactly. are very, very hard. But if you're leveraging social media to constantly throw yourself a pity party, you know, and all your posts are like that. And then, you know, if, if we get in the hat, like as, as kids, right. If kids like my kids are not allowed to have social media, um, my, right. my boys are still like, we're the only ones in school. <laughs> we're the only ones that don't have Snapchat. And we're like, eh. yeah, yeah. And by the time good 18, for you, yeah, by the time you're 18, you can make your own call on that one. But no, that's so great. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I, I think that social media, it seems like it, it maybe enhances that victim mindset muscle a little more in adolescence. But I don't have any proof on that. But have, have you seen that in in your practice and just people that you've interacted with? Yeah, there's a lot. Even though I'm in mental health, you know, in a positive way, there's attention to mental health, but teenagers it's so faddish so yeah there's like oh look I have and again I'm not making a lot of it but telling everyone oh I'm depressed or I'm I have an eating disorder and everyone responds with all their as you said oh I'm so sorry but there's not attention towards yeah what what they could be doing to make it better or that they're not just a victim to what happened that they again intentionally they have some control over what happens I don't think we want our kids to feel they're just at the brunt of the world inflicting things on them. Um, even though of course the world throws us huge, you know, but same with these kids in the book that their mother died, which of course they weren't responsible for, but there was no sense of ever you hear in the book, oh, those poor kids, they never viewed themselves as victims. They would have been surprised if anyone would have said, oh, those poor, poor children. Mm -hmm. um, because what an identity to develop a poor, oh, poor me, I've lost my mother versus right. yes, I've lost my mother, but I have this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lost and found. I tend to be towards the resilience of looking for what's found versus what only is lost. Yeah. And um, so that's what I try to aim for, you know, which doesn't mean talking about the bad feelings about it, but then what do you do with them? Just laying out, oh, this happened to me is not therapeutic. Okay, this happened to me. What, what does it mean and what can I do with it? And how can I make some meaning out of it in a productive way? I mean, in something useful. Um, you know, I took the loss of my mother and made it into a novel. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you find a way to process something and use it in a way that's empowering rather than just, oh, look what's happened to me. My wife and I, so you, you have to lead by example on that one. Right. Mm -hmm. of course, as a yes. parent. So, you know, we can get really wrapped up and sometimes my wife and I, we fall flat on our faces with that one. And sometimes mm -hmm. what, one of the tactics that we tend to do is we talk and think out loud. Like, so if our kids like see, 
um, <laughs> I got a, I got a speeding ticket with, with my kids in the car. And I, yeah. I, I was going through this, through this small town. We were, we were on our way to like this, uh, mm-hmm. camping trip and I was going 50 and it, it dropped down to 35 and I, I was in a school zone. Didn't know it got pulled over. And this guy, you know, he pulls me over and he's like, you know, not my town boy, you know, like that was my <laughs> attitude, right? So he pulls yeah. me over, gets a ticket. And, and I was, I was, I was pissed. I was like, dang, right? Like, but then I had to really, really think about like, what am I pissed at? Am I pissed at the cop or am I pissed at myself? Like, and you know, I'm All pissed right. at myself. So, you know, my kids were like, are you mad? And I was like, yep. I was like, but I'm angry with me. And they're like, what do you mean? Sure. And they're like, they're like, what do you mean? I, the, you know, the cop didn't let you off the hook. I was like, it's not his job to let me off the hook. I was like, you know, I, I was speeding and they're like, well, you didn't see this, the, the speed sign. I was like, that's not his problem. I was yeah. like, it's my problem that I didn't see. I broke the yeah. law. I was like, so I got to pay the price. I was like, his job is to enforce the law. My job in this was to obey it. I was like, so I can't be mad at anybody except for me not being observant enough. And that's really what it boils down to. It's not his fault for pulling me over. It's not his fault for, you know, could he have let me off the hook or whatever, what it, it is, it is what it is, you know, and versus- that's so perfect modeling it. Yeah. That you showed your kids. That was an amazing moment to show them. This is how you respond. I did something. I own it, but right. Versus, Oh, that jerk of a cop. Look what yeah. he did to me. It's not that fair. The, it's not fair. Right. I remember, I mean, I say when kids say it's not fair, it's like, what's fair? Like, you know, it's not about fair. Things happen and you it's what you do with it. So I think modeling is so essential because you could be teaching your kids by saying things, but if you're modeling always the other behavior, that's what the kid is picking up. So um, those are amazing moments to be able to show, particularly when you're the one it happened to you and to yeah. be able to admit you're wrong in front of kids. Is so right. Important. You know, I, I messed up because you're teaching them. They can fail. They can mess up. But they, what do you do with it? Right. Is it his um, fault? It's not fair. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I see that. I mean, I recently got hit by a teenager driving. He clearly ran into me and I got out. He was a lovely teenager. And he right away said, I'm so sorry. I wasn't looking. And I, I was so kind to him. I said, it happens, whatever. And I called the dad because I he lived down the street. And I just wanted to let him know what happened. The father started yelling, how can you prove he did it? I'm, he shouldn't have said any. And he started fighting me. And I said, oh, no. you know, your son was lovely. I said, why would you? You know, I, it was more about the model for his son. You know, right. why would you? He was try, he was he didn't even know what happened, but he was already covering it. And it was, you know, I'm driving on a road. You pull into someone. <laughs> but anyway, I said I was saddened to hear that because I thought his son was impressive. <laughs> wow so, see and there you yeah. go it's a perfect yeah. example yeah uh-huh. i i want to give you I, I know we covered a lot in um it, you know as far as intention goes uh when life gives you bumps you know how to leverage humor also just ways we can operate if our teenagers are kind of starting to pull away from us um ways we can honor them uh not jump in and solve all their problems, you know, throw them a golden parachute and then, uh, you know, showing what, what true ownership looks like, you know, I want to give you some time here to talk about, um, anything common that you might see in your practice that if you had the opportunity to speak to a large audience and say, man, if I could offer parents like one or two things that I see literally every day or all the time, just some ways to avoid this or be better about that. What would you tell the audience? Well, I think we covered one. The you know the top issue is letting, do not step in for your kids and letting them handle. Because I again, I rarely see it nowadays. The parents step in before the child has anything go wrong, um, and uh, so I think that's number one. And I think our own narcissism. I think parenting has become much more than when I was a kid, where my parents didn't worry about if we were upset, you know, or we felt bad because they didn't feel they were trying to be our good friend. So I think sometimes this protectiveness around our our kids have to be perfect because they're a reflection of me and I don't want them ever to be upset or to think badly of me or be angry with me um, is a big problem. We have to be able to tolerate our kids saying you're awful, you're mean. Yeah, you go, yep, I am. 
but how often parents are really having trouble doing that. Yeah. Um, and they're not, yeah, they're not serving their kids. We're not there to be their best friends. Um, and I've had parents say, like, even parents who could, their kids weren't sleeping through the night at like five and six, because all night long they'd get up and, you know, cater the child waking up. And I'd say, you, you have to let them struggle, you know, be upset maybe. They're like, oh, but they're going to be traumatized. I'm like, no, they're not traumatized <laughs> if they sleep through the, you know. Um, <laughs> but I think we have gotten very far from the idea of, now maybe they went too far the other way when I was a kid, <laughs> but now it's much more, let's protect them from any any bad feeling. And I think that will serve them very poorly as I'm seeing in late high school when something does fail, they don't get into the college they thought. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're just yeah. destroyed versus okay, there's good options elsewhere. And um, so those are the, yeah, I think letting your kids not be your best friend, <laughs> letting them tolerate feelings and let them fail. Yeah. And that's yeah. hard to do. That's really, it is hard. I mean, I'm a parent. I know I hate to see my kid fail, but if we can let ourselves tolerate it, we're really helping them be good adults. And that's our job to get them to be solid adults. Well, it's almost like, um, what, you know, what is the cost of not allowing them to fail? Like if we're really looking at like, well, I don't, you know, it's, it's the cost of them failing. Well, what's the cost if you don't? Exactly. I would, I would think that's right. much greater. Correct. Oh yeah. I mean, some of them are lost as adults. They don't, they're, you know, the failure to launch, they describe, you know, they don't know how to make it in the world. They don't know how to, um, yeah, we can't rescue them and they might go through a really hard time. Yeah. Mm. But if they see we believe they can get through it, that gives confidence. Because when we step in, we are really undermining them. We're telling them, we really think you're pathetic. <laughs> I mean, that's truly what, if parents could keep that in mind, that they're really right. telling their kid they don't think much of them versus. You this on your own. Right, right. Whereas nowadays, I mean, people don't give their kids any freedom. But I know when I was a kid, boy, at eight, nine, ten. I would take buses some places. I mean, I could figure out the world and my parents believed I could do it. And I think we've gotten away from that. Kids never have to figure out anything on their own. Yeah, I agree. We were, uh, we were just talking about this actually this morning. I was at the gym this morning. I was working out with a buddy of mine and we were talking about just, I was like, man, I was like, yeah, even social media alone, right? It's like, you could like look on, on your phone. It's like, oh, uh, Brad was in Colorado and you know, he had this fun trip and all this other stuff. He's like, when we were kids, you ride your bike to Brad's house, knock on the door. There'd be no answer for like a week or like, okay, well, I guess he's out of town. <laughs> then they come back and like, oh, I was in Colorado for a week. Oh, really? I didn't even know. And then the other thing too is like, you also knew like, okay, when the sun goes down or like right around five thirty, six o'clock, like I need to go home for dinner and that's, that's my check-in, right? Versus right. like, there was a lot of leeway, like when we grew up. So. Right, because you couldn't. And again, the phones and the social media. I mean, kids now are in contact with their children every 15 minutes. Even kids I know go to college all day long. When they have a problem at college, they text their parents who step in and solve it even at college, which is really, again, I think access, you don't want access to your kid at college. Let them let them figure it out. Right. Um, yeah, it's really gone. I sound so old fashioned. <laughs> it's gone so far the other way. I agree. Um, when I taught a bit at college or graduate school too, I'd sometimes, I noticed the change maybe 10 years ago where suddenly I got calls from parents that why did their child get a B on the paper? And the first time I was so stunned, it never would occur to me. And it, there was more and more of that, which that's amazing. A parent calling about a grade. <laughs> yeah. It's because it was B work. That's why. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> really? And talk to your kid about it. Don't yeah. ask me. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's great. So yeah. Um well, Dr. Carey, this has been awesome. I want to make sure um I'm gonna get give everybody the links where they or the link where they can find everything, but I want to make sure as far as as far as you're concerned, uh where where can men or our listeners, we actually have a lot of women listeners now as well, uh, where can our listeners connect with you and obviously find a copy of your book or if they want to know more? Sure. Well, the novel's called Meet the Moon, and you can find it on Amazon or, you know, any or your local bookstore, hopefully. Um, my website is um, 
K. Malawista author, and you can find it there. And then I have a professional one, Dr. I'm hoping I'm getting this right, Dr. Carrie Malawista. So there's lots of ways to reach me. My name is unusual. So if you Google it, you can find it. Um, uh, but beside the novel, there's other psychology books that teach psychological ideas using stories. So they're not technical books, but they're ways to, you know, things around parenting that use stories to teach. So they might be of interest too. Very cool. And then is there, is there another book maybe in the future? Uh, I don't know about another novel. That was hard. I, <laughs> I am. I just, I finished um, a recent a memoir that might come out. Um, oh, awesome. So, so we'll see. Very good. Well, I, we wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for coming on and sharing all these incredible oh. ideas with us. And, and most importantly, these diehard tactics that we can like, you know, guys can step away from this podcast, you know, definitely doing some things different. So thank you for providing that. Right. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for having the conversation. You bet. Gentlemen, uh, you won't have to worry about the spelling of Dr. Carey's name or anything like that. We'll have them all in the show <laughs> notes for you. Uh, you'll have a way to connect with her, buy her book, uh, all these things. Just head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash 418 for this show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash 418. Dr. Carey, thank you so much. This was awesome. You are awesome. Uh, <laughs> thank you for helping us change the game as fathers. Thank you. All right. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.